I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand how a girl could be kidnapped twice. But is that enough? Is that a good enough reason to make a movie? Because I wanted to explore something. Put my arm around her and drew her close to me and held her tight. She looked up at me, her eyes beaming. And I knew that I had found the little girl that I was searching for. I know for me, and I'm pretty sure this is true for most documentary filmmakers out there, that our, our hope is to institute some kind of change. I really did think that our film could save someone's life. That's Sky Borgman, director of Abducted in Plain Sight, the documentary that's taken Netflix by storm. But as difficult as it was to watch, making it was a whole nother story. I'm Doug Frazier, and this is What We Do. In this documentary series, we'll meet the people behind some of the most intriguing passions, hobbies, and jobs around the world. Abducted in Plain Sight is a documentary about the Broberg family, namely their daughter Jan, who's abducted by a family friend, not once, but twice. Netflix has tons of crime dramas, but nothing like this. And if you've seen this movie, then you know just how crazy it is from start to finish. If you haven't seen Abducted in Plain Sight, just be warned, there are a few spoilers ahead. I think the subject matter is the most difficult subject matter I've ever dealt with in any of my projects that I've worked on. I do work on a, a TV series called The Night That Didn't End, and that's dealing with murders and really, really difficult subject matter. But I'm the director and DP of The Recreations, so I'm separated from the people who have gone through this. Interviewing the Broberg family posed a new challenge for Sky. Some of the most difficult interviews came with Jan's mom, Mary Ann, and Jan's father, Bob. Interviewing the Brobergs, it was just a really brutal time. These interviews lasted for eight or 10 hours each. And then we went back and talked to Mary Ann again and talked to Bob again and talked to Jan two times after our first interview. So those are, they're hard because you're sitting and reliving a lot of these emotions with the family. One harrowing moment came in the form of a call the second time Jan had been abducted. The family hadn't heard from her in months. Just say hi to him, it's Jan! Jan! Jan, how are you? <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> oh, are you coming home? I can't tell you, I miss you. Are you coming home? <laughs> we need you. Truth really is stranger than fiction. And I think that everybody is really curious to just get a glimpse into the worlds of other people. It's infinitely fascinating to me why we do the things that we do and how that sort of ripples through our lives and our children's lives. And that's, that's what keeps me going is this, this fascination with the human condition. Growing up as a little girl, my dad would get National Geographic magazines and, and I would look through these magazines and I would see these people that looked completely different from me. And I just became really interested in people and in what's different about us. And then I got to this point where I'm like, there's not really all that much that's different about us. We're actually really just so much the same, but there are, our experiences and our surroundings are different. Difficult subject matter always forces me to just dig deeper and, and turn that mirror to myself and turn that mirror to the world and just work a little harder at understanding the things that I just don't quite understand. One thing she didn't understand from reading the book about the Broberg story was how they could have been so submissive to B. But then she found out from Jan's mom about her affair with B. This gave B more weight for blackmail, but it still wasn't enough for Skye. There was something that was missing. A major clue came across in a court transcript. On it was a back and forth between Bob Roberg and B about what had happened between them in the car. And so all of these pieces to the puzzle that didn't quite make sense when I was reading the book started to fit into place. And I was like, oh, this is how it all happened. And this is how this guy got enough on these people to essentially blackmail them. And honestly, going into that interview, I didn't know if I was gonna ask him about it because I didn't know if I had it in me. I didn't know if it was something he wanted to share. And I just had no idea if it was going to go there. 
During the eight plus hour interview, Sky asked the question and Bob, to her surprise, answered it. We were laughing and he said, oh, Bob, it's just kid stuff and I've got to have relief. I did the worst thing I've ever done as far as breaking the trust and the fidelity that I had with my wife. Bob's answer provided yet another twist in the already unbelievable story. Sky and her team, which included producers Emily Kincaid and Stephanie Toby, among a host of others, decided to hire editor James Coode. He brought a new perspective to the project. Things were going great for a while. Then the project took a downturn. For six weeks, the editing was put on hold. We just didn't care about anybody in the film anymore. Like we'd gotten to the point where we were just numb to everything. And I was like, I've got to find my love for these people again, for everybody involved. And, and I think Jim felt similarly to that. Sky took that time to get a breather. The project, as something like this does, took over her entire life. It even took over her living room, where they'd shot some of the 70s style flashback sequences. So she took off the wood paneling they'd installed and reclaimed her space. We've worked on this film for five years. So it's a long haul. It's, and you have to have a lot of commitment and a lot of passion to get through those five years or seven years or 10 years or whatever it is that anybody ever takes to make a documentary film. They certainly don't happen quickly. We'd come so far, you know, we had so much of the story and, and the importance of the story was so big that I just, I knew we had to move on. Never be anybody for me but Jan, never. Did you have concerns about the fine line between telling their story and going too far to make it feel like it's entertainment? Yeah, yeah. And that's where uh, that's where the, the screenings, like the public, when I'd invite 10 or 12 people over to my living room and we'd sit around and we'd watch it. And these are incredibly intelligent people who know movies and who, and some of them who don't know movies. And so those screenings became really really critical to me in getting their response as to what they were getting out of the film. And after those screenings, we'd go back and then uh, Jim and I would would massage the edit a little bit more. So so there were constantly those those feelings, you know, and there was also this this idea that I had had that I wanted I wanted it to feel like kind of this relentless slog because I feel like that's what that's what the Brobergs must have been feeling. Like it was just one thing after another, after another, after another. And so I did want to sort of create this feeling of relentlessness with the film that in my mind sort of mirrored the feelings that they must have had while they were going through it. I just got through talking to Jan. I said, you still want to marry me? She says, oh yes, B. More than anything in this world, I do. I think it's, it's what we're face with every time we think about the next story that we're going to tell, should this be made? And if, if the shoulds sort of end up outweighing the shouldn'ts, then I think that's, that's how we come across our answer. The first time we screened the film, we were accepted into Mammoth Lakes Film Festival. And when it gets to the part where Bob and Birch told are in the car, and finally when Bob admits that they had this sexual interaction the whole audience laughed. And I remember sitting there, and I was sitting there with Stephanie Toby, one of the producers, and Emily, and James, and my husband. And we all just kind of looked at each other while people were laughing, and we were like, oh, I wasn't expecting this. I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of laughing in that moment. It wasn't the type of laugh you get from a joke. It's the laugh that comes when what you're hearing seems so bizarre, so completely unexpected, that your brain seems to short circuit and spits out, of all things, a laugh. Jan's mom released a book back in 2003 called Stolen Innocence. The book chronicled the kidnappings, but didn't mention her affair or Bob's. Why, after all these years of keeping it hidden from the public, would Bob Broberg admit to what he did? Why not just take it to the grave? It seems he carried the shame of his act with him throughout his life. Even if admitting to what happened was cathartic, he certainly still carried that ghost until his death last year on November 5th. 
This feeling of shame or guilt isn't exclusively his. Like Bob, so many of us will live and die and never fix the things that hurt us most. I have to tell you, I have never, ever, ever been in a theater watching a film before with such vocal reactions from the audience at every single screening we had the audience was just like what no huh oh, you know? <laughs> and that i have to say it's so it's so great as a filmmaker to be able to see that people are responding to your work the film's been called a lot of things including jaw dropping and batshit crazy absolutely bonkers and bananas and it's just like it is. It is all of that. And, and the fact that people actually really live through it is, is really shocking and unbelievable to like the nth degree. Beyond the shock factor, Sky's intention for the film started to come to life. After screenings, people who had experienced abuse shared their stories with her. And for many of them, it was the first time they'd ever spoken to anyone about what had happened. I know for me, and I'm pretty sure this is true for most documentary filmmakers out there, that our, our hope is to institute some kind of change so that we can save a life or change a policy or change somebody's mind and open up minds. And so so when I thought about it more and more, I, I really did think that our film could save someone's life. My initial reaction to all of these events was probably not far off from the, the really more explicit kind of reactions we've been getting about the parents. And I think going in, I was more judgmental of the parents than I am coming out at the other end. I have an understanding of what they went through. And I also have a really, a much greater understanding of shame and how shame can be so powerful in, in just creating blinders and how denial can grow out of that shame. I mean, I like to think that I was a pretty pretty good at listening before and pretty good at taking things in before, but I think having dealt with this, I'm, I'm probably a little bit better at it now. I like to think I'm more able to listen and at least try to find compassion. Was Abducted in Plain Sight a success for you? I feel that this movie is a, a success at this point in time. I'm hoping that in the future, I start getting emails that say, I recognized a threat in my life and I removed that threat in my life and my children's life because of your film. That to me is the ultimate success. The more eyes that see the film, the more possible Sky's vision for the film's success is likely to come true. Though the film debuted in 2017, it wasn't until 2019 that it made its way to Netflix. This is where its audience and the social chatter around the film has grown exponentially. This team really of three women, we've been working tirelessly on this for five years and, um, and I'm happy that they're getting the recognition they deserve. I'm happy the film is getting the recognition it deserves. And hopefully that, that parlays into, into something else new and exciting and that can change the world. Hey guys, it's Doug. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. It means a lot that you took the time out to, to listen to this. So um, again, thank you so much. If you like what you heard, go ahead and subscribe. That way you can get alerts for future episodes. If you'd like to see a video version of this What We Do series, head on over to facebook.com slash whatwedodocs. There you'll find more stories about the intriguing passions, hobbies, and jobs of people around the world. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I wanted to give uh, podcast documentaries a shot. So I'm brand new at this, and I am welcoming any and all feedback. So uh, what did you like? What did you want to hear more of? Shoot me a message on my Facebook page. Until next time, stay curious. What We Do with Doug Frazier is distributed by WHRV for WHRO Public Media.